just want to welcome you all to the International Multicultural Education Department's Career Pathways. Tonight we are going to focus in on community college um, and we know that so many of our graduates have gone on and are doing amazing work at community colleges all around um, the Bay and further away and we wanted to tap into some of their brilliance um, and network you all with them also. So welcome. Um, we're excited to have you all. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bajaj. My name's Emma Fuentes, by the way. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Monisha Bajaj. I'm a professor in the IME department as well. I have the privilege of knowing most of you on this call, um, and it's great to see you. Um, I'm going to start with uh, just kind of acknowledging we are in the virtual space, but our university that is hosting this does sit on the traditional and unceded territory of the Ramaytush Ohlone tribal nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and we celebrate the public presence of Ohlone descendants who are working today to preserve and nourish their indigenous identity. And we hold this tension, this joy and justice, and this um, genocidal violent history, we hold this hypocrisy, this tension through awareness, dedication to land, and racial justice, and a commitment to joy as justice. Um, and we're talking about California community colleges today, which also reside on unceded territories. So just to bring in that as we get started, and we get started with hosting you all in our IME department virtual space. Welcome everyone. Please mention in the chat your name. Um, if you have a connection to USF, what's your connection? What program are you in? Are you an alum? Are you a current student? And maybe where you're dialing in from and what unceded territory that is. So we are thrilled today to have six, seven actually, because we just had a last minute addition to our panel, amazing panelists um, who represent different segments of the community college population. So we have, um, I'll introduce all of them, but then um, we'll call on each person to share about uh, seven minutes or so responding to um, some questions that we pose that you see in the chat too, their role in the community college system, how do they bring their IME or their degree program into their work and what advice they have for others. So we'll start with an overview of our panelists sharing six, seven minutes each, and then we'll have the opportunity for everybody to break out into breakout rooms with our panelists to ask more questions of them as well. Um, so I'll introduce each person and then perhaps we'll just go in that order if that's okay with everyone. I'm just gonna go down the order that's listed in the, in the flyer. So we first are thrilled to welcome Luz Navarrete Garcia, who is faculty in the English as a Second Language program at Santa Rosa Junior College. Luz is an IME EDD alumna as well as the part-time faculty who um, guides a lot of our TESOL students through the field project process every semester. We have Cassie Phillips, who is a full-time tenure track faculty member in the Promise Scholars Program Counseling um, at Kenyatta College and is an IME doctoral candidate. We also have Michiko Kealoha, who is a student life and leadership manager and instructor at Kenyatta College and is a very recent IME EDD alumna as well. Um, it's so great that we have such a critical mass of alums at Kenyatta College. We see the pictures and it makes us so happy um, that Manuel, who's not here tonight, is also a VP over there at Kenyatta. Um, we have uh, Rowena Tomaneng, who is an alum of the IME EDD program as well, a few years back, and is the president of San Jose City College. Um, and has also been a part-time faculty member in our department. Um, we have Gladys Sanchez Pantoja, who is the director of HSI Mikasa Grant Project at, Con I don't know how to pronounce this, Gladys, you'll have to help me, Consumnes? Consumnes River College, yeah. Consumnes River College and is a master's alum uh, of our IME master's program. And we have Anthony Amboy, who is a program lead, SEA program and guided pathways of the entire California Community Colleges system and is an IME EDD student currently. And lastly, and not least, we have our long-term member of the IME department, also an alum of the EDD program and full-time faculty in the department, Dr. Sadiq Kopal, who for many decades um, worked leading up 
uh, English language instruction at the College of Alameda and um, in Peralta colleges in general, and is a wealth of wisdom about careers in the community college system, as well as an incredible mentor and instructor of our students in our program. So welcome everyone. I'll pass it to Luce, and I'm gonna ask that each person do keep their own time because on the Zoom screen, it's hard to give hand signals. So if you do have a phone near you, uh, just put seven minutes on the clock just so we can be sure to get through everyone's um, responses to the questions. Um, I'll post, paste those in the chat again. And then um, after the round of everyone speaking, then we will move into the breakout rooms where you can ask individual questions to each of our amazing panelists. So Luz, take it away. Thank you so much for hosting this tonight. My name is Luz Navarrete Garcia. I'm, uh, as was mentioned, a USF IME alum. I'm a part-time professor in the master's in TESOL program. Uh, and I teach full-time in the ESL department at Santa Rosa Junior College. And that job was made possible by USF and the IME program. Definitely, that is what prepared me and what gave me um, not just the knowledge uh, that was needed, but um, I'd say the the experiences, the perspectives, the critical lens um, that's really served me well. So um, my role in the community college system, uh, well, first, I was a community college student right out of high school. I'm a proud community college alum. I was a student at the college that I currently work at. And after transferring and um, Continuing on with university, I became a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher for many years, but my dream job was always to work at Santa Rosa Junior College, at a community college. Um, and I didn't think it would ever be possible, <laughs> but after about seven years, eight years at the high school level, I figured it was time to try and make that dream come true started looking, I, I knew that I would need, um, or I, I wanted to uh, pursue higher education before doing that. So I was super excited to find USF's um, IME program with the language and culture emphasis, uh, second language acquisition emphasis. Um, and I love the program, but um, even more than, than the program, what it helped me for was you know, to be able to um, have that expertise, to have that um, the networking, the connection, Dr. Bapal is my professor, was instrumental, uh, Dr. Fuentes as well. Uh, so that's kind of the background um, that helped me to get to where I'm at. So after I, well, let me just say, I was ABD for a couple of years. I hadn't finished my dissertation and this job opened up at Santa Rosa Junior College. I'm a local in Sonoma County. I grew up here. I've lived here and I wasn't, I had a family here and I wasn't going to move away. So it was either Santa Rosa Junior College um, or I would just stay at the high school, which was fine. It wasn't my dream job, but it was fine. Um, so this job came up at Santa Rosa Junior College. Um, I had already started teaching part-time at another community college to get that experience. So I did have two years of community college uh, part-time uh, experience. And I was uh, blessed and thankful and excited that, that I did get the full-time position at Santa Rosa Junior College in 2014. And that really kicked me into gear to finish my <laughs> dissertation that summer before I started my contract. So I would start on the, um, on the pay scale with my uh, doctorate. Um, and since then, so I've been at Santa Rosa Junior College full-time since 2014 in the ESL department. Um, in my work, I bring the IME degree um, definitely for a lens and a perspective and a connection to research on equity and yeah, I'll say that's probably one of the biggest uh, components beyond my department of teaching in ESL. Um, on a larger scale, my leadership, um, you know, USF prepared me for, for the leadership roles that I've had. I've been department chair, I've been on president's councils, I've served in 
many different leadership capacities at the college and definitely um, everything we learned at USF has helped me uh, with all of that and uh, networking and, and just bringing in that lens and that perspective. Uh, so the advice I have for others, let me check my timing. Yeah, I have two minutes. Uh, the advice I have for others is if you are not sure what it, what a community college, like if you don't have experience with a community college, if you did not have the, the benefit like I did of attending a community college, uh, definitely first do research and make sure that that's the kind of place that you want to be in. Uh, we need we need people who are committed to the students that we serve, who are committed to open access, who are committed to serving the students where they are and helping them get to where they want to be, even if they haven't discovered what that is yet. And so doing that research, uh, perhaps uh, getting in in a part-time position, um, kind of paying your dues is, is what we've had to do, um, if not, that then even volunteering, talking to different people, networking with any of us here, <laughs> if, if we're in a position that you would be interested in. Um, but do all of that before you come in. Um, once you get to the application process, uh, we're looking for people who, like I said, are, are committed to and have, have their heart set on working at a community college to support our community and our students and not to see it as a stepping stone to somewhere else, uh, but as you know, a place where you can contribute and hopefully um, impact and bring everything um, that you can to make a positive change. All right, that's all for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Luz. That was fantastic. I'm gonna remove your pin and I'm gonna ask Cassie to step up to our virtual mic. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm Cassie, I'm actually Alexander now. I got married over the pandemic, but you can still um, call me Cassie Phillips. Um, so I am a recent new hire for the tenure track position, but just going back a little bit, um, I started working in the uh, community college system back in 2015, um, 14, 15, one of the two, I'm getting old now. Um, so I started off as a counselor, which is what I still do now. I've been doing counseling coordination um, for learning communities. And I would say that's been the highlight of my work experience um, since I've worked in a community college um, world is working for learning communities, more specifically a community um, called the Umoja community which is um, aimed towards helping um, our African descent students um, get through the college system in a more timely manner. Um, so I have a lot of experience with that. I actually was also a graduate of the community college system. So my first job happened to be at the place I graduated from. Um, so I, I went to Chabot College in Hayward. Um, and my, I'm going to say Dean at who, who was my counselor at the time. So the me of the system became Dean. Um, I had a really good relationship with her, which, you know, relationships are everything. So think of that now, um, who you are now is what you'll represent as later. Um, and we had a really positive relationship and she, we were able to bring that into, of course I had to go through the interview process. Um, but when I originally actually went through school, I wanted to focus on mental health. So that's what I was doing prior, um, was going through the therapy route. Um, so now I have been doing counseling. I'm not doing as much coordination now. Um, but my primary role is to work with the promise, promise scholars program. So I would say the special community in this is the high school students. So that's what we're really focused on is engaging our high school students and giving them opportunities um that take away the need for financial responsibility if people aren't familiar familiar with the promise um portion of things um and i would say that i'm this is my last semester um i don't want it to be all but dissertation i just want to be done with this process so in december is when i hope to be done and just do my final edits over the next couple months um but i would say that the ime program has actually helped me find my piece at what I'm doing. 
Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is that it's a struggle figuring out what's next for you, period. Like, you know, you get into a position um, and as um, Luz was talking about, like when companies are looking for your long-term impact on their organization, like that has to show in your interview. Um, and sometimes when you don't know what you want to do long-term, you kind of come in and you're just kind of talking, trying to hit points and questions. Um, and you may not be speaking to what the institutional values are. And that's so important to think about and focus on when you're going through this process. Um, keeping track of my time. If I'm thinking of what was important for me to always keep in mind in this process is who I was and what I brought to the table as not just a graduate and as someone with a degree, but as a black woman, as a woman, as a mother, um, as someone who shares similar goals and aspirations to the students that I serve and letting that show through to the committee because Ultimately, if this is the system that you want to be in, you need to think about the people in which you're serving, the school you're going to, that you're applying for, because none of these schools that we work for are the same. You know, the demographics that I work for now at Kenyatta are not the same as I was working for when I worked at Laney College. It's not the same as what it was when I was at Chabot. So when you're going into an interview, while you may already have a presentation ready, you want to make sure that you have something that's ready for the people that will likely be serving in the space that you're trying to get into um, and just knowing who those people are. Um, and I think that ultimately for me, that's what's most important is just knowing that I had struggles in life as a black woman it doesn't matter about the community college system so when i came into this space like i've always been kind of one of one in my space so when you're coming in as a woman of color regardless of what color you come from if you know that you don't typically represent the organization like truth be told is that you're going to have to say something and or do something that makes you stand out like it's it, it just kind of is the unfortunate or or the real the realistic reality of what it means to work in any system. Um, but I think that what, as I'm thinking about who I am and what I can contribute now is that I know that I've been able to contribute my passion, my desires, you know, my experience as being a single mother. Um, and, and like I said before, relating to my students in this space, uh, my more recent position prior to Kenyatta was working for Laney uh, primarily as a Yamoja counselor and coordinator. Um, so a lot of my students look like me. Um, and I think that when you're thinking about where you want to be at long term, you want to think about what your impact is and can be because forever is a long time. And when we look for these tenure track positions, at least in my position, I look for it because I wanted to be somewhere long term where I can contribute to the organization and to an organization that could also benefit from what I have to offer. And I think that um, while I think no one owes anything to anyone, I think that these are such hard jobs that are to come by. Um, sometimes people don't know how hard um, presidents such as Rowena work for to get these positions, you know, ready, you know, so when people come in and it's like, I'm not sure what I want to do for the rest of my life, but if I'm here for two years school and it's like, dang, it took me, you know, six years to get this position, you know, and for you to leave, like there's no guarantee when you walk out of that space that they'll even be able to get it again. So just know that when they choose you and when they vest in you, that it's not just them saying, that they needed someone to work. Like if they, they just needed someone to work, like this isn't like going and getting a job at McDonald's where there's that rotating door. This is a position that, or these are positions that are coveted. People are coming from them from far away. Like I've heard the story about the position that I just got and how many applications came through. I have, you know, just to speak freely, like I went through two years of trying to get a tenure track position, two years. You know, very few people walk into the job and get it on the first try. So um, I see Luz, she said, don't give up. And that's just it. Like if you get shot down one, two, 10 times, it's just because these positions are hard. And in order to really get to where you need to be, you have to show passion. You have to be able to, to give something. Yeah, that's my time. Thank you so much, Cassie. Amazing perspectives. And we are cheering you on as you do this last phase of your dissertation. You're near the finish line. Great. So next, I believe, Michiko, are you next on our list? Is that right? 
Yeah, I can you. with you. Awesome. Um, and I love um, Cassie and I are in the same college, so I'll drop a fact sheet if y'all are interested. So hi, Michiko, que aloha, she, her, hers. Um, I work at Guinada College and I'm starting my 10th year directing student life and leadership. We, um, to give you a perspective too, in this school district, um, we've got three community colleges, it's about 40,000 students. Guinada has about 5,600. We're a Latinx serving institution. And we also just got our Anapizi, which means that we serve our Asian, Native American, and Pacific Islander students. Um, and so I so appreciate and love being here because of USF and encouragement from Dr. Bajaj. I've also gotten to have five years already at Guinada um, as an instructor in their education department. And some of the things that I've been able, there's so many things that I've been able to like bring mm -hmm. to the community because of University of San Francisco and this program. Um, recently, we are going, um, all the departments are going through program review. And um, I've been able to, as the new co-chair of Student Services Planning Council, have a task force. And we specifically looked at how do we make sure everything that we do is anti-racist and focused in justice work. And so how do our program reviews reflect that and assess that? Um, even like through IME, like learning, how do I read an article? Like, what does that even look like? And I know that's like such like basics, but even being able to do that and learn that I'm working with a team now so that we have a new bias response, bias education team on campus. So we're trying to get that started so that we can address community harm on campus. Um, also too, I feel like there's just so much good curriculum and activities from on-campus and off-campus activities that I've been able to incorporate in my classroom. Um, and there's also been just so much in like, how do we question our day-to-day -day services? So how we do basic needs for students, whether that's um, food or transportation or housing, um, IME has really helped my lens open up of how we can support students even getting like brand new multi-stall all gender restrooms as a basic human need and making sure we're talking to our administrators about that so students are supported and their basic needs are met um, and even our land acknowledgments of like hey Kenyatta like we should do this and so being the first to bring up like we should have land acknowledgments or like we've never done anything for Indigenous Peoples Day or like our community, our indigenous community. And so being able, I think too, to have folks in the room, like there's so much power in like having my vice president be an alum from IME too. And like, oh yeah, do you remember that reading from Dr. Fuentes' class? Yeah, oh, let's bring that into our student services meeting. Or like, do you remember that activity? Or like, oh, Dr. Bajaj brought, brought you to Angel Island. Like, let's do that with students. And having that like dual support in the community college is like, oh my gosh, just like the depth of things that we've been able to do is so cool. And so uh, advice is like, find your homies on campus, but also like if you haven't been in the community college system, similar to how um, both both women just shared, uh, I, um, I started taking community college classes. Uh, uh, as a like 14, 15 year old. And that really helped. I've been on a lot of hiring committees and folks do have that lens. They're like, I want to see that you understand, fully deeply understand our student population. And so if you've taken classes, if you've been a community college student, if you've volunteered, that makes a huge difference on hiring committees. And so even like I, I have experience working professionally in four-year private and four-year public universities. And having that is what really helped my hiring manager, what she told me of like, okay, you know, what's up? Um, so some of my folks who are trying to go from four-year private university um, were saying I had to volunteer any way I could to, to make sure that I truly understood because it's a different, it could be really a different world. So that's a, a little bit, I had my like app, there's a timer app on Zoom that you can like put up in the corner now, but I totally got oh, all excited and forgot. But thank you again for letting me share. I'm excited to connect with y'all.
Yay, thank you so much, Michiko. Those are great tips and perspectives. So appreciate it. And Michiko's dissertation was all about her work at the community college. And I highly recommend it. If you want to download it, it's on the repository to give some great stats. What is it, like 5 million students in the California Community College? System? Oh, yeah, it's 2.5 million. And so we're the, right? California Community Colleges is like, there's so many things, but like we are considered one of the like largest and like most, I, I forgot the words in the dissertation, but it's like, it's a huge impact across the world, the California community colleges. So the biggest, to, be able to be a part system, of it. The biggest yeah. higher system anywhere in the world yeah. is the California community college system. Yeah. And so, like the impact for justice work yeah. is deep. So, thanks y'all. Thank you. And I forgot to mention that Michiko will be part-time faculty at USF School of Ed starting in the spring. She'll be teaching Woo! for the ESSA Higher Ed and Student Affairs Program. So we, we love to keep um, our students in, the, in community with us. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Now we will pass it to a different perspective. Dr. Rowena Tomaneng, president of San Jose City College is gonna share a little bit about, well, you were faculty for so many years, so you can share that too. And then ascending to the top of the, of the food pyramid here. So Rowena, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It, can, if everyone, can you hear me okay? I'm hoping that I have a stable internet. I'm in the student center at UC Irvine. But I just have to say that I just love the any space that I am in with IME. Because when I had already been a practitioner in the California community colleges for many, many years, and um, I think it was almost 20 years yeah, 20, no, no, 17 years. And then I decided to go back to get my uh, doctorate degree at USF. And it felt like I was home, you know, and um, everything that the department is about is an affirmation of all of the work that many of my colleagues here have said is so critical for the diversity of the students across generations you know, different experiences that we serve. So it just was such a affirming, nurturing space for me that um, I, it's just a blessing and a privilege. So I just wanted to just start there. But, um, but I have actually been in the community colleges for uh, longer than 30 years. You know, similar to some of my colleagues, I was a community college student. I went to Cypress College and I uh, was blessed there to have some nurturing professors uh, who encouraged me to think about education and transfer and guided me to transfer to UC Irvine uh, where I did my uh, bachelor's degree in English. And at UC Irvine, I also um, was blessed to have a couple of professors that took me under their wing to encourage me to go to grad school and my first doctorate program was at UC Santa Barbara in multi-ethnic literature um, right after UC Irvine. But unfortunately, you know, it wasn't a community of belonging. And so I did leave there uh, traumatized actually. And it took me a couple of years to get over the emotional trauma of the department. So I left before the doctorate and I landed in the California Community Colleges. Um, I uh, was offered a tenure track position at De Anza College, which I took. And there I was able to teach multi-ethnic literature, Asian American studies and women's studies, all areas that I was very, very passionate about, starting with my undergrad. And um, at De Anza, I was able to grow in many, many ways because I did have a community of other faculty and classified professionals and a few administrators who were very much engaged in institutional transformation uh, for realizing our racial equity goals uh, for the institution. So uh, after uh, being a faculty member for 12 years, you know, I was given the opportunity to uh, start a civic engagement program uh, with another faculty co-director and I was able to bridge 
uh, the work that I was doing with my students and in the community uh, with the campus. And so that was very exciting um, work that I got to do social justice work on campus and then also with my community partners. And from there, I um, then was asked to serve as an acting dean, uh, which you know was a fine position for me because it was in the division that I had been building in and doing uh, multicultural transformation work. Um, so I did that for a little bit. And then I think the most impactful role for me there was when I advanced to Associate Vice President for Instruction. And that is the role that I was in when I started the IME program. And so um, uh, I think in terms of how I incorporate um, the philosophy and the approach and just the practice of IME, um, I do it in my leadership. Uh, I do it, you know, continue to do that in my teaching. But now that I am the president of San Jose City College, you know, it is such a great fit because I have a very strong ethnic studies department. I have, you know, uh, faculty colleagues who are finishing up, <laughs> you know, their uh, doctorates as well, the Gamboas uh, with the IME department. And so, um, so it's just a place of building, especially during this time when the pandemic has impacted so many of our communities and then we are also in a racial reckoning. So I, as an institutional leader, have been actively, have actively brought in an integrated humanizing education, decolonizing the curriculum, you know, in all aspects of the institution. Um, uh, and I think in terms of time, you know, um, my colleagues have also shared that there are different multiple, and you could see from my trajectory, there are multiple roles in the community college that you can play and be very impactful. And uh, what I encourage all of you to do if you are interested is to continue to um, connect with us, the connection with us and reach out to us because there are many positions in student affairs, in instruction, also in administrative services that you can have a big impact on transforming student lives, you know, every day. Um, and I'm happy to I'm happy to share with all of you uh, other roles. The other thing that I'd like to say, if for folks that are interested in higher education administration, that in the different roles that I've had, I've been able to see the different types of impact you can have in each role. So the faculty role is very powerful in terms of you have the direct contact with students in the classroom in that transformation work and uh, self empowering work that you can foster. Um, in terms of the different levels of admi administration, you know, there are pressures when you are a middle manager in terms of you know uh, priorities that you're getting from the top you know like me as your president <laughs> and then also um, priorities that are coming from below you know from the tenured faculty our associate faculty and our classified professionals um, and i i do want to say that the president's role or joining executive cabinet was very powerful for me because I really could see how I could change and collaborate and co-create with everyone else in the institution to support students and keep everybody student-centered so students can meet the goals that they have. And if they are meeting their goals, they are lifting up their families, they're lifting up their communities, you know, and ultimately, we want to break that intergenerational cycle of poverty and racial inequity that continues to persist, you know, in our society. So I think there I'll go ahead and stop and, you know, really welcome all of your questions and connections with me after this panel. Thank you so much, Rowena. Um, great perspectives on the role of different aspects of the system that you've 
been an integral part in. Thank you. Let's turn to Gladys Sanchez Pantoja now. I will um, try to pin you if I can figure that out. Thank you. I'm like, how do I follow that? Thank you so much. Like, I, inspirational words for myself. I'm taking notes, so thank you for that. Um, so hello again, Gladys Sanchez Pantoja for Nashikareya, and I have the pleasure of serving as the HSI Mikasa Project Director at Cusunas River College. And we are a four college district, uh, Los Rios Community College, which were the second largest community college district in the state of California. So we have, we serve a large number of students. Cusunas River College is its own, you know, little unicorn because we are a medium-sized college and you're, you're going to hear about this terminology and sizing and what that looks like and, you know, and faculty and, and the impact that you can have on resources if you're, this is the route that you're interested in. Um, but we are a, a minority serving institution, which means obviously we serve a large number of minority students and as the whole community colleges, of course, we welcome over 70% of, of, of students of color into our system. So I say all that and those facts and that information, just so that you know the importance of working in a community college and the impact that you can have in student life. Um, I came into IME kind of like by, you know, I stumbled across this, this wonderful program. Um, I did my undergrad and I had the pleasure of working at Sacramento State University for the College Assistance Micro Program. So a very, Great program that I went through myself. And in there, I had the opportunity to connect with Dr. Perez, Manuel Alejandro Perez, and that's how we first met. Um, and, you know, like I did some other work, nonprofit, and for some reason, you know, we connected and I ended up working um, with him again in a community college within Los Rios, a different one than Casuna's group. And as I entered the community college district, I remember he, personally asked me because I was like, oh, you know, this is so different than like the four-year university. And then he just asked me, he's like, what is it about community college that makes a specialty? Like, you've got to find that thing for you. So it's a little bit of my advice, but also like within like telling you a little bit about how I came out into this program. And as I started working more with the different support services um, programs and within Los Rios and in, in that American River College when I was there, I really found out like why I wanted to work at community college. It was personal to me, even though I didn't have that personal experience because I went straight into a university. I understood the value and the importance of community college, what it represents to students who are, you know, not sometimes they're at a high school, the non-traditional students, like the population that we're is so important and so unique, and it really impacts communities and it gives them an opportunity for social mobility. And you could see it. Like we are really around, like I have high schools right next to us and we could see those students coming in here during their lunchtime. It's a, a labor of love. So to me, when I found that and I found out that that was my passion, I came across IME and I was like, okay, this is the program for me because I wanted to be intentional and make sure that whatever I did as my master's was something that was gonna improve my work and my craft and how I provided services. And IME did just that for me. I bring that with me every day when I when we talk about developing a student services collective within our, our campus so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page, that we're maximizing resources, that we're eliminating barriers. So our, our collective actually gets together to make sure that we are identifying institutional barriers and we're working together to eliminate it because we definitely believe in the power of, of a collective. And all of that came out of, of course, the tools and the additional resources and support that I got through IME. So I bring that work with me every day. Of course, as an HSI director, it is more than just, you know, implementing a grant by the um, Department of Education. It is about how can I make sure that the services and resources get institutionalized and absorbed by the larger institution to make sure that we continue the support for students, that it doesn't go away after five years, right? It is my role, my responsibility to make sure that the students get supported and that they're making, that they're meeting their goals and that we're also moving along other Latinx identified professionals to make sure that we increase the number of representation that we have in our campus and in our district. So it comes with a lot of different, you know, roles and responsibilities, but I, I love that. And I love the fact that, you know, I have those additional tools for my me. And on a personal level, I think 
I don't know, like I gotta tell you this quick story as like also part of my advice. You have such a unique like group of folks here within instructions within the network that USF IME like provides for you all. I really, really want you to take advantage of it. Because when I came into the program, I was already married and I, you know, I, I got pregnant with my son. And I remember I was so scared because I didn't know what, I had never been in grad school. I'm first gen, you know, low income, didn't even know what, what it was. And I remember telling Professor Clemenis like, oh my God, I'm pregnant. What does this mean? Am I going to get kicked out? And she was like, oh my God, relax. We're fine. We're going to work through it. It is totally fine. When I was writing my, my thesis project with Dr. Kand, like, walked with me, supported me throughout everything. I thought it was like a new mom, you know, obviously having to take my son and, and wait with my husband as he was in the car while I was in classes. Like all of that, it was like a, a supportive community that even now I work with those folks in different areas. Like we have, you know, USF alum from different areas uh, within School of Ed, though we work very closely together to put on programming, uh, intentional programming at CRC. So we're really, you know, it doesn't, it didn't stop there and I don't want it to ever stop there. I still am very connected to this network and, you know, piece of advice, definitely reach out to the folks that you get to connect with today from us that you, if you have questions about how we did what we did, that you do reach out because this is a really strong network and that is the beauty of IME or one of the beautiful things about IME. So I really encourage you all to do that. And if that you are interested in the community college, that I, I echo what all the sentiments that all of um, the previous speakers have said, get in there, you know, and really learn about why you are passionate about this work, because it is definitely a, a work that comes from the heart. So and that's the kind of work that we need in the community college, because it's a very unique population that we serve. So I'm open to connect with you all and you all can continue the conversation beyond today too. So thank you all so much for having me. Thank you so much, Gladys. Um, it doesn't feel like it's been five years since you had your little one, but because I remember it so clearly, but we're so thrilled that we had a got to have you and your baby as part of our community and for always. So thanks for all that insight. Um, let's turn now to Anthony Anvoy, a program lead, SCA program and guided pathways in the California Community Colleges system. And let me add a pin and hand it over to you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, oh, I didn't set a timer, so let me just do that real quick. I apologize. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Anthony Alvoy. I am a former community college student. Um, after I graduated, after I transferred and graduated, um, I worked uh, at a community college in a local capacity as like a, a, a tutor, like within the system there. And then I went to get my master's degree at USF. Um, and I got it in the right, I got an MFA in writing, so I actually got a poetry degree, but I leveraged it to become an adjunct instructor um, teaching English. Um, and then from there, um, I was introduced to um, the Academic Support Center um, at Los Madonnas College. I was working at Los Madonnas College. Um, I was working at Chabot College and I was working at University of Silicon Valley um, as a private. And um, I was uh, working there, but I really started falling in love with that support center. Um, and so I ended up trying to spend a majority of my time there um, and what that led to was me asking the greater question about equity um, and impact, because in my classrooms, I was seeing 25 to 35 students uh, per semester, and I was seeing 400 students a year um, in the writing center. And so for me, that was where my heart was going. And um, after the pandemic, I didn't get classes anymore. Um, so after the pandemic started, I didn't get classes anymore as an adjunct. And um, that led to me seeking larger system level goals. And that led me to the chancellor's office. Um, I had the very fortunate um, experience of the position that I wanted opened up. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to make sure that everybody knew before I kind of go into the, my job uh, is that a lot of the time in the position that I'm in or like the position that you want within the community college system isn't always available because these positions are full-time permanent positions. Um, and so in terms of thinking about impact at the system level, um, 
one of the things is like you have to really consider each community college as own little system. Uh, and then if you happen to end up getting within the chancellor's office, now you're involving all currently 1.8 million students. Uh, Michiko, it was 2.5 and now it's 1.8 uh, due to the enrollment decline. Um, so that's something that you have to really consider as you navigate through um, getting to a system level position like this. Um, and so let me introduce you to my position. So um, I am the specialist that oversees uh, student equity and achievement program and guided pathways program for the state of California. Uh, for student equity and achievement program, I handle um, the funding guidance, methodology, um, legislative recommendations um, and projects uh, for $523 million of student equity and achievement program money. Um, so that half a billion dollars uh, gets to shoot um, cultural awareness issue, um, some emergency aid for students that the pandemic, uh, campus climate tutoring, basic needs support. So those areas are for student equity and achievement. Um, my internet connection is unstable. Give me one second. Um, and then I also handle guided pathways, which is the exact same thing. It was previously $150 million over five years. It is currently $50 million over four years. So I handle I handled roughly um, about 650 to $700 million um, at one time. And so um, with that in mind, um, I, I have the fortunate circumstance of being involved in the C program. Um, and with that, be, with that um, thinking about my work in IME, um, I'm able to bring in the breadth of knowledge that I'm learning from this program into my work. Um, I was recommended by my dean to go into a doctoral program to further advance my career in the future. Uh, but for right now, with everything I do, I love my work uh, being a part of C. Um, I love being able to design projects, um, lead webinars, um, work with colleges at the ground level. Um, because a lot of the time, as you start progressing up into the chancellor's office, your work gets further and further removed from students. And the heart of the work that I do is ensuring that colleges have the recommendations and the leverage necessary uh, to benefit disproportionately impacted students on their campuses. Um, recently, that has been the push. Uh, it wasn't so much the push before, um, as previous analyses have shown that a lot of the work that was being done on college campuses um, wasn't was protect wasn't really protected in legislation enough and so our goal is to really think about how we can benefit that push right um, and especially with um, trying to nudge into a more race conscious into a more um, equity focused lens a more racial racial justice lens social justice lens all those lenses um, to really focus on trying to figure out the best way that students fit in the center of all that and um, one of the challenges for me is managing the needs of um, the campuses, the students themselves, um, the faculty and the administrators that work through C program um, and, and Guided Pathways, and also my executives as well. Um, the, for me in particular, with my particular specialist position, I have the benefit of being able to interact right as in the middle. If you want to think of like an hourglass, I'm literally like right in the middle where I can focus on executive level needs and what my dean needs, but also being able to interact with the colleges in a way that I would love to, that I love to be able to do to be able to um, relay what the colleges need up and filter what the executives need down. So I actually have that great midpoint. Um, and so if anybody's interested in getting into a position like this, where you're not necessarily in the classroom, but you're more managing funding, you're more providing recommendations, you're doing projects like reports and legislative reports and working with the state government in that way. Uh, the first thing that I always recommend is that you go to, the, I put the website in, it's calcareers.ca.gov. You have to get certified. Um, certification is the most important aspect of uh, becoming um, within the system, becoming a person within the system itself. Um, certifications for Cal careers also focuses on, um, you can do K-12 system. So there's actually like specialist level at the K-12 system. There's deans and education administrators at the state level as well, but you have to be certified for all of them. Um, and that's really important to recognize, um, especially if you want to work at the systems level. Um, you're not gonna probably handle as much money as I, I do because I handle the most money in the state. Um, but you're going to handle um, a large, large sums of money, uh, ranging for anywhere from a million dollars to like $300 million if you're in strong workforce program. Um, and so with that being said, as I have 10 seconds left, uh, really just thinking about how much impact that you want to have. Um, 
that's really what got me into this particular situation. And I hope that as you think about your careers, um, how much impact would you like to have as well? And that's the system level, I believe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. That's really helpful perspectives and um, tips and links. Thank you so much for dropping those in. Appreciate it. And we will now turn to Dr. Popal um, to share a little bit about the wealth of experience that he has had in the community college system, particularly Peralta, and the careers that he has helped so many of our graduates um, find in the California community college system. So we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Popal. The questions were a little bit about what work you did in the community college system, how you brought your IME perspective to that work, and advice you have for those seeking jobs in that system. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for your very generous introduction, including me in this uh, panel. Uh, uh, my name is Sadiq Popal, as you heard and see over there. And I started working for community colleges. My first job after I got my master's degree in TESOL was at Chabot College. So I worked there for about five years as a part-time or adjunct professor. And while I was there as a part-time, I was looking for a full-time opportunity because during the day I was teaching K-12 in the K-12 system in Hayward. And then the evening on Saturdays, I would teach at Chabot College. Uh, so every time there was a full-time position in the Bay Area, I applied for it. I probably applied for every and every community college, there are 20 of them in the Bay Area. Uh, and I successfully failed at most of them. I couldn't get the job. But every time I went for a job interview, I tried to listen very carefully. And after I finished the interview, I sat down and thought of what the questions were and what my answers were. And I didn't want to give up. I always, I mean, I got these letters of rejection, but I said, you know what? I'm determined to get a full-time job. So for those of you that you're seeking full-time opportunities at community colleges, be prepared to get what? Rejection letters. But remember, don't give up. You will get the job that you want if you persevere, if you work hard, if you don't get disappointed. But each opportunity that you get in a job interview that's a learning opportunity. And that's what I did. But I took notes. I said, okay, this is what they ask. This is what I say. How could I make it better? I actually went and consulted other professors that they were a lot more senior than I was at that time. Now I am the senior, but there were a lot of other senior people. I asked them, you know, this was the question. This is the answer I give, you know, any insight. You know, they generously shared their, uh, uh, their experiences. And you should have added that one, should have added this one. And I always took notes and added and went from one interview into another, got the rejection, another one, another one. Finally, I was accepted at two colleges, my, because I interviewed at several at the same time. And then my, my problem was not getting a job, but which one to choose. So that usually happens to people that they look for jobs and they go from place to place. Anyhow, I accepted a full-time position at, at College of Alameda, and I worked there for 25 years both as a uh, uh, ESL instructor and the chair of the ESL department there. And not only for the, the College of Alameda, for the whole district that we call it, Peralta Community College Districts. And there are four colleges, College of Alameda, Laney College, uh, Berkeley City College, and Merritt College. And I was the founder of and, and chair of PIAC, which stands for the Peralta ESL Advisory Council. That this was a group of all these representative from all these four colleges that we decided on the curriculum for all these four colleges. I worked there and chaired that until I left the job and retired from that position. But the process, and I've been involved in the hiring of ESL instructors part-time and full-time at all four community colleges. Even today that I'm no longer working there and paid by them, they asked me, they have been asked twice to be in the panel for the interview and to participate in that. And I've been also asked to uh, be part of the uh, uh, tenure review process for a College of Alameda. So I'm still involved in that process. So the process is this, that there is a paper screening process. They look for what? That you have a master's degree in the field that you want to teach, okay? And so if your field is like the master's degree doesn't say that this is the exact field, they're looking for 24 units in the field that you want to teach. If you have less than 24 units, then you may not pass the paper screening thing. 
So like if you get a T cell master's degree, for example, you get more than 24 uh, units actually. Uh, um, but if you're a doctoral student, our concentration is uh, basically 12 units, but they look at what? Your master's degree, how many units you had for, as part of your concentration, plus what you have as, uh, as part of your doctoral. If you could make it 24, you will be considered. And if you're not, if you think that there is something, you know, that it's not complete, there is also a process called the process of equivalency. So if you have experience in the field, plus coursework, and you do not qualify on paper screening, you apply for equivalency. Please don't take no for an answer, okay? You go fight for it, you will get it. And so once you pass the paper screening, you go to the interview, the first interview. Depends in different colleges, they have different rules, and different processes. But uh, in the college where I work for a full-time position, you have to go do three interviews. One first initial interview with professors and sometimes we brought also from different you know, student clubs, also up re representatives. And then after that, usually for one position, there are 25, 30 people. So you choose like 10 of those that they could pass the first you know, uh, screening thing. Then they come and do a teaching demonstration. So they are evaluated on how well they teach. They give them a topic to teach, either it's a grammar topic, usually it's grammar or a writing or something. And then they come and demonstrate that 10 minutes to the uh, interview uh, panel. If they pass that and then that panel or that interview uh, uh, committee will choose or recommend three to the president of the college. Uh, and then the president of the college will have the, the president, vice president, the dean of the department, plus the chair of the uh, department will interview that person for the third time. From all of that, those three people, they will choose what? One person as a full-time. So full-time, this is the process. Part-time is not that difficult to get job. And usually you have to start as a part-timer before you can start what? As a full-time because they require part-time experience. And to do that, those of you that you are now in the master's degree program, I strongly recommend that you look, you go and look in these community colleges, look for these, um, what we call it, faculty diversity program. Uh, you apply for faculty diversity program internship. So they will take you in, they will train you, and then they will, you will be working with one professor to shadow that professor, work with that professor, and then they, and then you will be teaching classes individually even before you finish your uh, um, uh, master's degree, but you'll be under the supervision of a full-time professor. The class will be offered under the professor's name, let's say Dr. Bajan, but uh, 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 Ren will be teaching that. But the schedule says Dr. Bajan, but Ren gets the experience that she can put on his uh, experience. So that's what you can, how you can get the job through the faculty diversity. That's how we did it at the Peralta. And so if you do not go to faculty diversity program, you're done with your master's degree, you still apply for part-time jobs. And when you get apply for part-time job, uh, if you stay in one college for several semesters, varies from college to college, then if there is a full-time position because of the number of semesters that you have worked for a community college, you qualify to go for the full-time job interview, but that doesn't guarantee that you will get the job, okay? And when you go for that interview, again, that's the same process I said. You don't have to go through the paper screening because you have experience teaching so many you know, semesters, but you will be interviewed, you'll do teaching demonstration, and you will, uh, uh, and you will also uh, be interviewed by the president, by the dean, the vice president, and the chair of the, that department. Uh, while you're part-time, in order to basically make sure that you are noticed, okay, and that your work is, you know, noticed, what you do is noticed, and you're preparing yourself for full-time position, you need to get involved in the college life there, okay? It is possible to get involved in committee work. Uh, while part full-timers, they get credit for doing, becoming part of a committee. Uh, 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 for part-time people, you don't get any credit. But if you have that on your resume that you work in this committee, you work on this committee, you work on this committee, 
that counts towards something that shows leadership, that shows interest, that shows that you really are committed to working for community colleges. So I strongly urge you, if you are working in a community college right now or in the future, don't always ask, okay, I work for two hours, give away the money. If you're like that kind of a situation, you're not going to go very far because they just find you very greedy. But you need to kind of, this profession of teaching is a profession of giving. So you need to give in order to gain, okay? So you could work in committees. You can also work in students uh, and student clubs. There are every community college, they have students clubs for different ethnicities, different groups, different linguistic groups, different ethnic groups, different racial groups. So sponsor one, work with one, make it possible for them, advise them, become, a, become an advisor for a club. There are these opportunities that part-timers can do that you could help them prepare them for this presentation. The other thing you can do in order to qualify yourself for a part-time, for a full-time position while you're working part-time, again, Getting a part-time job is easier, much, much easier than getting a full-time. To prepare yourself to get a, uh, a full-time job, you need to show currency in the field. You need to sh show leadership in the field. And to show currency in leadership is what? You need to, if you cannot publish, publish is a big word, but you can go to these conferences. You can present you know, a, a, a workshop. You can present a paper. You can present a poster session. We. Uh, at uh, IME uh, professors, we will help you. I help you personally, help you help you write the, the abstract for the presentation, have you present and just uh, see how you do and give you feedback. I even had students that they came and presented in a class that they got you know, input from all other class members so that you can fine tune your presentations. So you do all of that, all of this prepares you for a full-time job in a community college. Again, it's not impossible, but it is painfully difficult to get one, uh, a full-time job. Part-time is easy to get. And believe me that when you get the full-time job and you pass that uh, uh, first four years or two years, it varies from college to college, and you become permanent, being a permanent professor in a community college job in a community college is like being like the uh, you know, Supreme Court justice nominee that you're always there. <laughs> and 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 when you retire, I retired from community colleges several years ago. Uh, but my retirement, my pension is higher than the amount of money I was getting when I was working full time. That is kind of unbelievable. But believe me, it's 1800 I get eighteen hundred dollars more than I was when I was teaching. How it happened, I don't want to know. But it is, uh, there is, that's what is happening. So Thank you, so much. Uh, so you are in for a very, very good uh, profession. I believe those of you that you want to make it a profession, but I believe my time is up. I need to stop now. Otherwise I will um, so take no. somebody else's time. Again, thank you and good luck to all of you. Great step-by-step -step yeah. information about how one approaches this. Thank you so much. So we're gonna change up the plan a little bit since we are not a humongous audience here. And instead of doing breakout rooms, I think we'll just ask people to formulate their questions and we'll all stay together because there is so much overlap in the advice that people were offering. And I will just pin all of our wonderful panelists so we can see them. And if you would like to unmute and ask your question or place it in the, um, in the chat box, we can ask it to them out loud. Um, then maybe we proceed that way. Uh, where are all my panelists? Let me see. Who am I missing here? Gladys add the pin, Rowena add the pin. Great, I think that's everyone. Is that everyone? I'm missing somebody. Oh, that is everyone. I'm just missing myself as the moderator. Okay, I'll add myself here. Great, who would like to ask a question? I invite you to unmute since we're not a humongous group or you can put it in the chat if you're feeling shy. Um, let's ask these wonderful experts some questions that you have on your mind. If I could ask while people are, are um considering their questions. Uh, maybe in the chat, you can put what brought you to this session tonight. Uh, what are your interests? Are you currently already at a community college? Um, you know, that might help us. Great idea, Luz. 
You're such a good educator. Yeah, um, I can go ahead and ask uh, yeah, a quick please. question. So um, I've always uh, been fascinated with the, like, being an advisor. Uh, I started off in community college after I uh, got out of the Air Force. And my advisor, and just just the experience, it was up in Oregon, uh, but just I, I really appreciated that that one-on-one -on -one experience with my advisor in terms of like setting off the rest of the course in terms of undergrad and, and master's work. So in terms of going that route, in terms of being an advisor, what are there any like, specific steps that y'all would recommend that I take in terms of post-graduation? Thank you. And again, thank you for everyone for uh, speaking. Dr. Papal, it's always great to see you as well. Thank you. Anyone I, want to take that question about the advising route in community colleges? I could jump in because yeah. um, not like across our system, like our 116 community colleges, not all colleges and districts have academic advisor positions. And so the main positions that we have are counselors. And then um, at some colleges, uh, some advising is happening with project specialist positions. For example, you know, as we're thinking about, re, you know, um, uh, different types of positions to serve our students now. Uh, many colleges are forming student success teams <laughs> and a project specialist position will sometimes function as an academic advisor. So I just wanted to throw that out there. There are a few districts in the Bay Area that have academic advisors. I have two academic advisors at SJCC but then my sister college does not have academic advisors. Evergreen Valley College has project specialists, which I have too, but that's, that's who's doing advising in their area. And for advising, you don't need a master's degree. You just need a bachelor's degree um, to uh, become an ac academic advisor. Gladys, is, that, is your position project specialist? Do you wanna jump in on that at all? So we have within our grant, we have two project specialists or student support services specialists is what they call it. Um, but it pretty much aligned to what was just mentioned. We are a California Get a Pathways. So our focus in the community colleges are really to get the students through the educational pipeline and into graduation and transfer. So there's a lot of focus on that. So you will hear about the career and academic communities or meta major. So you're going to hear, hear different languages of the interpretation of the guided pathways. But it is um, ultimately success coaches, success teams that go in there and support the students through that, like onboarding and through you know the the duration of their time here and into graduation. But if what you're looking for is counseling then yes, you would have to go, of course, a, a little bit of a different route. Um, so just wanted to get clarification if it was advising, because that can, those positions usually lead and open the doors to roles like mine. Like I was an advisor prior to this role. And then when we got the HSI grant, um, I, you know, it was a natural fit because I had the cultural, like the social capital on the campus and understood that pathway. So it just worked out to, to bring that implementation into the HSI work. But you know, there, it, it, those positions are so great. And while it doesn't require the master's, having the master's is great because it makes you more competitive because those positions are pretty competitive to get into, um, especially in the community college system. So having that, the IME master's and then the cultural, you know, like understanding of like the, the or like the equity and social justice lens will, definitely you know give you an upper hand so definitely suggest that you you're doing the right thing cassie did you want to jump in i saw you put in the chat well yeah i was just mentioning um because i heard the word advising and i think sometimes when i hear people use that word advisor they are just saying counselor um but they are kind of separate things but retention specialists are um positions that i'm hearing come up a lot as well and like in my last few roles 
um, as counselor, I've worked with a lot more retention specialists than I've seen anything else. So um, even at um, Kenyatta, where I'm at now, we have a retention specialist, but she just finished her master's. So she's doing part-time work as a counselor um, because our, our roles are very closely related. So if you're thinking about like, maybe, okay, I'm done with my bachelor. So away in the community college system and you know that you want to do counseling, I think that could be a good role because those jobs, at least within our district, I've seen a lot of um, to get in. And then once you're done with your master's, now you've built that cultural capital, you know, and things of that nature within your campus so that you can um, try to network and either get in part-time I mean, I, and I know that uh, Mr. Popal mentioned that as well, but that is something that everyone should know. Like if you're thinking about faculty, whether it's teaching or um, counseling, that part-time is going to be likely your way in, um, whether it's at our I'm sorry. I think um, there was a question in the chat also about getting that counselor role, which you touched on, but if you want to elaborate on as well um this is what could I do if I wanted to work as a counselor um I think just getting in part-time I mean I hate saying it but it's it is what you know it's connecting it's finding um it's finding a way in like I I don't know of too many people who just kind of apply like I and not for not at least for part-time it was like oh I know this person who was hiring they're looking for part-time counselors do you have the skill set? You know, let's talk to these people. Um, and typically that's where the part timers were kind of in some cases pull from pools. But um, I would just say personally, it's just been more so from word of mouth that I've heard about a lot of part time positions. Um, you'll see that even within different um, programs that they'll send out an email. Um, it could be from a dean and I've seen this across different campuses they're like oh if you know anybody with a degree who's looking to do part-time you know send them our, send us your resume um, so it is staying networked and connected definitely go through the part-time pool and apply um, but it's one of we have one of those roles where you can't get the experience without the job and you can't get the job without the experience um, high school doesn't necessarily prepare you for the things that we're doing I mean yes and no um, I've, I've done a little bit of both in terms of like middle college. So I've been able to work with high schoolers transitioning into community college. Um, but I would just say, keep applying, um, look for part-time, look for a way in. And even if you start off in one district, but your desire is to work for another, just get in somewhere where you can start building your, your resume in the specific type of business of so community college. I don't know that working at a um, CSU would prepare you for working for a community college. Again, there are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences. Our population is not necessarily just the students who could afford it, just decided to apply and get in, which is what would be more representative of the CSUs and UCs. We're dealing with the underserved students, the underrepresented students who, you know, maybe didn't pass a certain test score, couldn't afford it, you know, all of these other things. So um, just being mindful of that, through the process. Thank you so much. Anthony, you want to jump in? And oh, and then I want to make sure not to lose. There was another great question by Doris in the chat. Oh, great. People are answering. Thank I you. Go, to, go for it, I, Anthony. I wanted to acknowledge Doris's question as well, because um, even though I'm in the system, I did start as an adjunct instructor. And one of the things that I want to note is that being an adjunct instructor, um, even in a place with a lot of community colleges, is very hard. Um, the reason why is uh, because you might only get one class at one college starting and um, depending on the size of that class, if it is um, a guided pathways uh, oriented class, which means that it has um, an extended class period, right, you could be looking at three hours a week or five hours a week, and you're getting paid $55.7 an hour, um, that translates into a little over $150 a week. Um, and so after you take out taxes and all of that, if you don't have either a support network or a partner to live with, or if you don't live at home, it might be nearly impossible for you to pursue your dream as being an instructor, um, especially if you want to be a teacher um, and even a counselor at this point, because a lot of part-time counselors are getting picked up. Um, it makes it very difficult to get started. Um, I had the fortunate experience of being an embedded tutor in my master's program in my last semester. And that directly translated into me becoming a part-time instructor at Los Medanos College. Um, but even within that, there's 
there is still a totem pole, right, in terms of which part timers get which classes. Um, so you start at the bottom. And I had that happen at Chabot. I didn't get classes until the pandemic, like almost the pandemic I was uh, about to start. Right. And so thinking about like where you're where you comfortably fit with some of your basic needs not being met, how far you have to travel. Right. I mentioned I went to university, worked at University of Silicon Valley, which is private. Um, it's a three hour commute from Walnut Creek, where I live, because I wanted to live where the highest concentration of community colleges are, um, to Milpitas. Right. That's a three hour commute going one way and then coming back. And then on top of that, you might have the commute going where another place. So um, I really respect the idea of wanting to get more involved in the campus, but there's a reality that sometimes depending on the circumstances that arise, it can't, you can't, you just, you just can't because you have to put food on it, you have to feed yourself, you gotta pay for your rent, all that stuff. So um, if I had to be real about it, like there's some privileges that if you have, you need to take advantage of them. If you live at home or if you live with a partner, like lean on those resources to be able to pursue your academic dreams because, um, or your work dreams, because it was very hard for me. Um, I was one of those people that got into education because of that one particular situation that I had. And so um, I, I'm very fortunate now, you know, five years later to be in a full-time position Right, and I, I, it's full time permanent. And so, for me to get to that point, though, I had to go through a lot of ups and a lot of downs, right? Not just a lot of it wasn't a lot of ups, right? It was a lot of downs. And I've I've heard horror stories. I had a one of my friends was an adjunct instructor, and she um, had to travel from Modesto Modesto to Pittsburgh, right? And I don't know how y'all understand that distance, but like she would travel from Modesto to Pittsburgh to take to do classes and then she'd go to do classes at MJC and then she'd go do classes at Los Pacitas College. And so like, think about the commute that you're going to have to have, but make, but she had that support network of like, she lived with a partner at home, right? So there was that, she could focus on doing the things that she needed to do to get us where she wanted. And so thinking about that, that process is really important. And you can already make the assumption of how that does, what that does to your mental health, what that does to your physical health, your financial health, right? And I don't really have to explain it any deeper than that. You really have to consider all those factors as you navigate through this space. Um, so I wanted to, to acknowledge that reality, especially that was my own reality that I had. Um, so I just wanted to be there. Great. Does anybody else want to respond to that question about the balance? I know some responses came in the chat, Doris's question about how to balance everything and I know that I would just really say quickly that I and, and I know I just said it in there but to reiterate it like I've always really appreciated the community college system like there has been great opportunity as long as you communicate with um, your boss about you know what your life is like I've never had anyone who was like you know what nope I know you said you had kids but I need you here until you know seven or or anything like that like I've always been able to be very transparent about what's going on in my life whether it's school work whatever and been able to adjust um and I think that that is something why a lot of us look to these roles um, because we don't work the traditional at least for faculty 40-hour work weeks so depending on which side of the space you plan on being on for faculty on average, we're about 30 hours a week. Um, and th that is our contract um, hour or contracted hours as opposed to classified is 40, something like that. Um, so that makes a big difference in your in your work world and you know, working from 10 to, to five as a, or eight to three as opposed to, you know, eight to five, you know, makes a difference in commutes and in family and everything. So especially with dissertation, like I, I I'm able to utilize my downtime to write, I'm able to really just, you know, it's not, it's one of those, once you're, as long as you're doing your job, you're meeting the needs of what you're doing, like you have the space to really be in the world that you need to be in and, and work on all the other things around you. But I think as with anything, even as we tell our students, it's, it's what you make of it. Thank you so much. I also just wanted to add that I agree with Cassie, <laughs> that the faculty role is definitely the most flexible, you know, if you are in the um, academic affairs route, as I increased responsibilities and changed administrative roles, um, it did become and it is difficult, you know, to even talk to people about work life balance, you know, and um, for me, um, the COVID 
time. You know, at, at SJCC in my district, we were one year, a little over one year full remote, but then managers were brought back along with our classified professionals in August of 2021. So I actually was so healthy and, you know, like mentally and physically during that remote time because I cut down the commuting time and I actually had time to do those reflective, you know, um, breaks and then also do power walks, you know, right in front of my house in my neighborhood. But now, you know, but since we returned, it is very intensive as you move into um, managerial roles that require sometimes almost a 24 seven attention, um, you know, and when crises happens uh, with, you know, students or with the college, then, um, you know, you're just called upon, you know, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Thank you for that perspective. I was just going to offer one more thing yeah. that really works for me is it takes a support group and team to really help you get through it. Whatever, whoever that is, whether it's, you know, whatever you identified as family, chosen or, or, or not, or whatever the case may be, your partners, your friends, your colleagues, it really does take a, a big support group because it makes the, the all the difference in the world there are days that are so long and you have to attend to so many presentations meetings you know you name it but when it makes such a difference when you have a supportive community in the space that you work in that it it really does all the makes all the difference in the world and there are i do want to like obviously somewhat a little bit burst out bubble because sometimes it's not perfect and you do have to you know, I had to come to terms personally, like it's not always going to look exactly how I wanted it to look, but it comes in waves and you just appreciate those moments where you do have more of a downtime and can commit more to the family obligations and have more of your self time and really enjoy those um, because it refills you for when those busy times kind of come in throughout the semester because it does, we go in waves with the students too, I feel like. Yeah, great. Maybe we could just um, maybe do a quick round, a little lightning round to close out because we're reaching almost the time of ending. Um, uh, and I know, Lucy, you have to go. Maybe do you want to go first in the lightning round? It's like something that has brought you the most joy in the work that you do. And real quick, we'll just do a lightning round and popcorn to the next person after you go. Lucy, do you want to start us off? I'm sorry. Um... <laughs> I just to put a message in the chat, my students are trickling in. Oh, I was going to so, ask if you want to just um, say a word of farewell or something that brings oh. you joy in your work and then log off. The students bring me joy and I'm about to sign off to go <laughs> give my full attention to them. Thank They're you fabulous. so much for joining Good night, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for Bye. being here. All right, on my screen, uh, Michiko's next. The same as Luz, it's like I had a student just today who came by the office and was like, hey, like he was, he graduated 10 years ago. Um, and he was one of the first student groups that I had. And he was just like, I, I just wanted to see you and say hi. And like, this made such a big impact. And so, yeah, that's definitely, that's my why. Great, do you wanna popcorn it to someone? Popcorn to Gladys. Hi. Same thing, like the beauty of our community college, I wanna echo what was just said, is the fact that you see the impact and the students come back with their kids, with their family, and you could see the results in the community. They come back and do the work. We have so many CRSD alum who are now in different roles, faculty, administrators, classified professionals, like so many things because this is like their community and they wanna make a difference. So it's the work that we do. It's like, you see the tangible results. So it's, you can't beat that. It kind of gets you to not be so tired, but although you are tired, but yes, but it's the beauty of it. Let's see, uh, Rowena, do you wanna go next? Great. I just echo what everyone has said around the students because I am just always lifted 
my spirit, my energy, mentally, physically, when I see the impact that we're making in support of our students. So, you know, I have students that I've seen in graduation where the mother is graduating with the daughter, or I have students bringing their little babies up on stage. And when I see that, it is just so worth it in terms of all of the hard work and the efforts, you know, that we do on a daily basis at our colleges. And I'm gonna popcorn to uh, Cassie. Thanks, Rowena. Um, I would say definitely students bring me joy. Um, and uh, yeah, overall, it's just the outcomes. I think everything that we're doing, I mean, I hope the reason why most of us enter into the community college system is because of our students and, you know, who we can impact and how we can help. Um, but same thing, like I'm still so connected to my past and present students from across different campuses. I think actually De Anza, when I worked there, like I'm probably the closest to those students, um, still my previous students. And, you know, just recently I went to the birthday party of, of one of uh, their children. So, you know, just staying connected and just knowing that you never know, like you could be the Dean who's gonna give someone the chance that you were given. You know, and you could be anything that's, you don't know who you're impacting and where those people are going to end up. So just knowing that what I do holds a lot of power, like, you know, we need a teacher to teach, you know, the astronomers, we need a teacher to teach the president, we need someone to lead the next doctors. Like, I think we just, we're so, we have so much power and it's just so much beauty in it. Um, and I'll popcorn it. Uh-oh. Um, Mr. Kopal. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my final comments, would be, first of all, I echo whatever, everything that you said, uh, but in my field of teaching English as a second foreign language, we get students, immigrants, that they come with a lot of skills, with a lot of experiences, with a lot of knowledge, but there's only one obstacle, and that obstacle is communication and language we give them the key for success. And that's what brings the most joy, that they come and then, then later on, within a year or two or more or less, depending on where they fall when it comes to the proficiency test that we give them, then they, they become able to practice what they did in their home countries. That is what brings the most joy to us, giving them the key for success, means of communication. Thank you. And I'll popcorn to, um, to Anthony. I have two things to say, and uh, it'll be quick. Uh, the first thing is that even though I went through these difficulties as an adjunct, um, I still remember the difficulties that I had as a student and as an adjunct in my work. And what brings me joy is ensuring that people don't go through the same difficulties that I did. So I try to set the stage for those that come after me. Um, in that same vein, the one thing that I like to say, especially working at the system level, is that I want my work to last longer than my time here. Um, whether that means beyond my full-time permanent status and after I retire or even beyond my own life. So that's the energy that I like to bring into my work. And um, it, what, what, it's what brings me joy because I mean, get to work with um, all these co community college professionals here. Um, it's a some capacity. I'm able to uh, make a difference, hopefully make a difference in their experiences to, so that they can benefit their students as well. Um, so that is my general goal. And that's what brings, brings me joy. Thank you so much, all of you, for your wonderful wisdom, your advice, your connections. And I know that our IME community that's here, as well as when we post the video on our, our newly formed YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for doing all of the flyer um, formatting and also monitoring or keeping up our YouTube channel. Um, so appreciate it. This is just such wisdom for our community and we are so proud and thrilled to be in community with all of you who have passed through or are still working on your degrees with us. This is what keeps, I know I can speak for Emma and I and all the faculty to say, this is what keeps us going is getting to work with amazing human beings like yourselves um, and getting to do this work that really just, you know, putting those ripples out to, to work for social justice and social change in all the different roles that we all occupy. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening um, and keep up the amazing work that you're doing in the world. We're so proud of all of you.
Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Bye, wonderful everyone. to see you all and hear you all. Bye. Bye.